Welcome to episode two of Education and Color. Today, I'm joined here by Dr. Larry Johnson. Uh, Larry, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. I am Dr. Larry Johnson. I serve as the second president of the Stella and Charles Gutman Community College, which is a part of the City University of New York. Thank you for that. Now, we're just going to dive right in and go into our first question, which was, what was your educational experience like growing up, and what was your relationship with school and education in general? Uh, that's a really great question. So I grew up in a very small community in Belle Glee, Florida, uh, which the median income was about 25000 um, high poverty rate, one high school, one traffic light. And <laughs> that spoke to really, just in brief, uh, some of the, 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 I would say the impact mm-hmm. um, that that had on me in terms of being ready for college. Uh, but it was a small community that really focused on ensuring that students had what they needed to be successful. So my early years were, you know, centered around teachers who were non-BIPOC, non-Black indigenous people of color. And that inspired me in a different way because I thought, I said, well, maybe I can be that young black brother who would teach English because I love reading. I saw that that is one of the areas of emphasis for me. And then that really fueled my passion to move on to Florida a University, which is a historically black college university, to major in English literature. And really that began the journey. And I discovered at that time that my clarion call was to truly move the needle to make sure that I was a representation of men of color who were moving in disciplines who many thought not of English, like English literature. Mm-hmm. Why would you want to do that? Why not think about, you know, athletics or STEM fields? But for me, I knew that preparing me to be in any occupation that the English discipline would do that. So that's my earlier uh, We'll say experience uh, with just education coming from you know poverty, but understanding that the ways out of poverty is education. And it's funny, you know, I had a feeling that we we're gonna be like best friends because you mentioned <laughs> English literature, and I was like, oh wait, I studied that in college too. But um, and then also Clarion Call because now I'm gonna have to. I wanted to Google it right now and be like, what does Clarion Call mean? <laughs> but I'm gonna use context clues and assume it means like a purpose, right? Yes. Mm. Yes. All right. So the next question I got is, have you ever had a male teacher of color growing up in the K through 12 system? And if so, who stood out the most and why? Wow. So interesting uh, in that I did not have an academic uh, male teacher of color, Mm -hmm. such as in English, reading and math. But I did have a academic professional who was a male of color in my band classes. Mm -hmm. So by trade, I won't say by trade, but my interest was music. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that was what really fueled me after my mother passed away. I joined um, the elementary band that led to joining the uh, marching band in high school. Mm -hmm. And it was my uh, band teacher, Mr. Willie Pye, who really, I would say, uh, helped close some of the gaps and some of the insecurities and some of the the thoughts I had about, you know, Mm -hmm. worth and and being enough, you know, because you you lose a parent at 12 years old. I was Mm -hmm. moving from a state um, Georgia to now a new state in Florida, just trying to reacclimate, not knowing anyone. Even prior to moving to Florida, I did not have uh, male teachers of color. So he was the one and he inspired me and he really talked to me about what it means to be not only an educator, but what it means to be a, a black man and how we have to show up differently and how we have to really make sure that we are not only showing up differently, but we are paving the way for others. And he inspired me to do that. And you know, so ironic. I mm-hmm. talked to him about two weeks ago, and he's in his 80s now, Damn. but still Damn. bright, uh, still you know wants to make sure that mm-hmm. we are living out the legacy that he instilled in us. So yeah, I had one, but not in the traditional sense of what you would call an, an academic mm-hmm. in terms of a discipline, but being a band director, the extracurricular, that really is what really helped me to get through life. Mm. And it's mm-hmm. funny, when you're talking about that, uh, I just had one guy pop into mind mm-hmm. who was like, uh, he was my first teacher of color, a uh, male teacher of color when I went to ninth grade, mm-hmm. and his name was Mr. Thompson. And he was like a, uh, an older guy who was really into like jazz, and he had a very silky smooth voice. And the book that we read, I think was called The Color of Water. And so we read that book, and I was like, damn, I, I was in a point of like, 
self-discovery as well. And it's crazy to see how much of an impact somebody who, again, looks like you have similar experiences to you can give to you during your, like, your developmental years. Even like going back to middle school and elementary school, I never had teachers of color, mm -hmm. but I had like, like let's, let's say the janitor or like, well, it's a funny story with the janitor. I think one time like in kindergarten, like I peed my pants <laughs> and, and the guy came, came in and I didn't say nothing because every time I kept raising my hand, the teacher said, no, put your hand down, put your hand down. But then the guy came in and cleaned everything up and we were talking, he made me feel better. Whereas the other teacher just said, stand outside. And I'm like, you know, I'm standing outside, like my pants are like soaked. And the guy offered me, you know, a new pair of pants and everything else. And that made me feel better. But in the moment, I was so embarrassed. So it's crazy to just, you know, think about the impact they can have at that young age, even if they're not in that academic role, so to speak. No, oh, absolutely. And I think that when we think about uh, leaders, uh, we have to think about them in, in terms of, of different dimensions. You know, some leaders will come into our lives to prepare us for some aspect of mm -hmm. our, our growth and maturation. And, and we can't just say, okay, well, this is only my band director. You know, mm -hmm. I did not see him as only my band director. I saw him as a, a mentor. I saw him as a surrogate father. I saw him as a friend. I saw him as a brother. And I think that when we were, you know, educating our young men of color and even our other diverse populations, we have to think about what is the role that we want to play in this student's life or how can we align them to persons of color who can help them to really move through many of the trauma and the mm -hmm. you know, many of the struggles that many of the students have because we are still in a society, even post, you know, COVID-19, mm -hmm. where trauma still impacts our populations. I was just looking at some survey data recently, and students are still impacted just from the trauma. They still feel mm. stressed. They feel still feel overwhelmed by what they experience. So I believe that we have to teach students to really figure out what is it that you want mm -hmm. in a mentor. Because mentors are not all encompassing. We have to think about what aspect of their, uh, their knowledge mm. base that we want to glean from them to help close some gaps that we may have. And I agree with that because like I've had a variety of mentors throughout my career. They've been women, they've been men, they've been men of color, they've been women of color. And each of my mentors I u I utilize for like a different part of my personal development. So some I would have for my academic growth, some I'd have for my career growth, some I would just have for like my emotional growth. Because the other thing I realized too is like when you look at like male suicide rates, especially for like, you know, men of color, it's like crazily high. Mainly because we're taught at such a young age to like stifle all that and keep it in and like that whole boys don't cry type of thing. Like growing up, at any time I felt like that knot in my throat or like I wanted to show that emotion, I'd always think, oh don't do that. It's gonna seem girly, it's gonna seem this or it's gonna seem whatever. But then as I would meet these people, these older men who were like, nah, that's cool. Like I cried like last week or I cried <laughs> whenever. And I'd be like, oh, really? Like it's not a taboo type of thing. It just allowed me to be a little bit more open with myself. But again, that's not the luxury. I, and I use that word very intentionally. It's not the luxury many like boys of color have, depending on like where you're at. Like New York City, yo, it's crazy. You're always going to find like that mentor going into the public school system. But I'm curious, like in the other public school systems, apart from um, your band director, did you have any other uh, mentors in that way? You know, I, I mm -hmm. would say not as well. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving, mentioned earlier, moving from uh, from Georgia uh, to uh, South Florida, again, it was a band director. Mm -hmm. It was this time my <laughs> yeah, elementary yeah. school band director. Uh, and it, it, it was those were really the, the experiences. And I think that one of the things that we have to take in consideration is when we do have public schools, mm -hmm. we have to realize that they many of them will lack the resources. Uh, the resources could be, you know, to access to counselors, the resources could be access to you know mental health professionals, and the list goes on and on and on. And I think that that really has an impact on really the growth in, in the, uh, the maturation of, of a young person. And I think that's the, where we have to look to our community organizations. Mm. We have to look to that alignment to ensure that those young men and women are then you know positioned to be successful. Because if we just depend on just society and the the external factors that they're experiencing in life, then we begin to see the statistical data that shows that school to prison pipeline has increased mm. because of what students are not getting in their respective communities. So I, I think that in my experience, you know, most of uh, my development and most of, you know, my support really came through, you know, music. You mm. know, I, I was a drummer, I played, you know, drums in church. So for me, 
music was healing for me. Mm -hmm. Music was that place where I can have an outlet. So quite naturally, I gravitated toward those men, you know, who happened to be uh, men of color. But there were also, you know, women of color. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it was my stepmom. It was, you know, other leaders in the community. It was my godmother who, you know, adopted me into, you know, surrogate adoption, mm -hmm. you know, at the age of 12. You know, she was a band parent. Mm -hmm. And now she's become that, you know, permanent fixture, not only in my life, but that of my siblings. So I think we, we have to look at those community connections, those community organizations, whereas the schools may not have the ability to fund the type of programming that will holistically uh, mm -hmm. support one's development. I feel you on that, because like, even when you look at like some schools, if they don't have the resources to do so, if we take a community-based approach to education, that's much different than just, okay, whatever happens in the schoolhouse stays in the schoolhouse, and once you're out of here, you're out of here. Like when I was um, teaching in the Bronx for a short time, I had a student who would always punch everyone else. I don't know why, he just always wanted to punch everybody else. But we had after-school activities and clubs and what have you. So we had a boxing club. So I'm like, oh, idea, let me just get these mitts and start quizzing him, right? And every time he gets something right, I'll let him punch me. Because everyone else is saying, oh, he's a bad kid, he's bad, he's bad. But I I feel like there's a difference between being bad and misunderstood or not having the proper outlet because there's different right. modalities of education and you know everyone has a different way to absorb information after doing that with him yo he was like a great student he stopped punching everybody and he would just <laughs> be punching the mitts instead and even during class sometimes right like when we had lunch or whatever and he wanted to stay back for five minutes like oh mr kabir can i just punch the mitts with you and i was like all right cool but you're gonna get quiz you're not gonna punch it for no reason and he'd be down with that Unfortunately, he had to leave uh, shortly after. I think they moved to like another state. But when he was in the process of leaving, he gave me a hug. He's like, oh, thank you so much, da, da, da. Like, I almost cried. I was like, oh, that's mad sweet. But it's really that community building because now I could have easily been like, yeah, he's a bad kid. Let me just stay in the corner, <laughs> stop punching everybody. And if you keep doing that, I'm going to send you to the office. Mm -hmm. But taking that extra step, really trying to understand that student, of course, it's hard, it's, I guess, hard to expect you to do that with every single student but that's why the community matters and where you're at matters like the assistant principal the principal what the rest of the staff does and if they do community events like recently um there's been something that we've been doing a master class and so the master class we've been teaching the students about real estate finance personal investing esports and driver's ed but in the evening we offer the parental version of it so now it's not just the students that can learn it. Okay, good that you learned it. Tell your parents to come to the one this evening. That way we're building that sense of community with everyone so that they could, the parents can see, oh, look, what my kid is learning, I could also be engaged in and get something out of it. I feel like that really does give a boost of confidence to everyone involved from administrators and teachers to even the parents and students. Yeah. You know what you just mentioned to mm. me is really, I, I think, the power of the community college. I mean, we, we provide the access and uh, success for many of mm -hmm. the students, and it is the community approach. That's why we have community mm -hmm. in our name. And I think that when we think about programming, we're not thinking about just the student. You know, community colleges have students who are traditional age, they have students who are non-traditional. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at really the programming as a community college administrator, we're looking at the holistic development. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about how can we prepare even the middle school student, the high school student, when we think of robotic camps and when we think about coding camps and et cetera, from former institutions, I always thought about how can we begin the next generation in terms of cultivating into mm -hmm. them, even at sixth grade, what it means in the future to be a tech professional. Mm -hmm. So that is to me, you know, I think it dovetails well into the role, you know, I think of community and how the community college does that well, because they think about which organizations provide the social emotional wellness for students, how can mm -hmm. they partner and have those students that are on campus be recipients of that support and, and vice versa. So I think that that to me, when you think of the community college mm -hmm. and community, there is a seminal relationship there because we, we can certainly fill those gaps where they exist, where you know, one cannot because of funding or other mm -hmm. you know, uh, barriers, I think it is through that, that strengthening partnership in the community, who many community colleges, if you think about it, they're in the communities where there are your, your students that are uh, historically marginalized, mm -hmm. they're in minoritized communities, and I think that helps to make sure that if we're funded, you know, at, at the right rate, then we can, we can do more with the services um, that we need. And that's just more national. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, like, because you, you were talking about community, and then it's funny, I thought of it, I'm like, yeah, community college is literally the word community is in the name. Um, how have you been able to fuse the community within the communal learning of community college? Oh, gosh, that, that is a great question. So I'll give an example from my most recent experience mm -hmm. in Phoenix, Arizona. When I first arrived to Phoenix, um, my goal was to truly learn the community. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the, the oldest community college. It's the flagship. Uh, and it was over 100 years old. I was the first African-American president 
um, to be named. And that within itself was a major milestone, but it was important for me to truly understand what does the community need. Mm. So I began meeting with the superintendent of the area. I met with many of the faith-based leaders to truly understand, so what are we struggling with as a community? What are the poverty rates? Where are the pockets, the zip codes, if you will, where we have medium income levels that are below $25,000 or our medium income is worth 30, 35, and then how can we then partner to make sure that we're changing not only the lives of the students, but we want to do generational, uh, you know, support here in wealth. And for me, it was really taking that lens. And after meeting for about six months, I met with the city manager at the city of Phoenix. And I said, so how can we really make a difference? How can we really partner? So in thinking about the workers that were there, mm -hmm. you know, one of the barriers was, okay, they get off at five and they will have to leave work and they have to go through the traffic. I said, so what if we created a neighborhood college? Mm -hmm. We are a community college. Mm -hmm. What if we brought college to you? So we did that. We worked for a couple of months and we aligned programs where we put students in a cohort where they were mm -hmm. learning at their job after five o'clock in a space that mm -hmm. they were already familiar and my faculty were teaching them. So oh, that program dope. began to yeah. grow exponentially, but that's just one example of really putting the community or the college in the community. And similarly at Gutman Community College, I took the same approach. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know we're in Manhattan and many people will say, our students, you know, your students don't come from Manhattan. So I look at the data. Mm -hmm. Most of them come from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. uh, your second, you know, highest population is from Brooklyn and then Queens. But I said there have to be populations in even in Manhattan mm -hmm. where, you know, communities are struggling, where we can make a difference. So I reached out to David Garza, mm -hmm. CEO of Henry Street Settlement. And I said, I began to have that same conversation. You know, I looked at the poverty rates. I looked as they compared, you know, to New York State, uh, New York City, and also, you know, nationally. And I said, this is a community where I believe the college can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So we recently uh, signed an MOU with Henry Street Settlement to now provide a cohort, the first cohort in the college's history that will be enrolled in our networking and cybersecurity programs. Oh, that, yeah, to yeah. me, is the important and to me it is what we should be doing as a community college mm -hmm. and it's crazy you know I'm just thinking about that and I'm like wow like for me my college education was really like traditional you know go do everything and what have you but I had a lot of peers who that traditional approach just didn't work for them there's a variety of reasons as to why but you know the way I look at it one size does not fit all so by you now bringing let's say the classes to the the workers in Phoenix and then doing this partnership over here just really shows the impact of what you can accomplish if you actually care about the community. Because I also feel like sometimes it matters about who is the one at the head kind of leading these um, change initiatives or making these meaningful connections. Because the thing is too, what perked my ears was you said cybersecurity. That's meaningful because that's a huge growing market. Like there's gonna be jobs in there in the next 10, 15 years. And even if you made a partnership with let's say something that provides skills, but maybe not in an arena where you can get jobs, sure it'd be great, but we gotta look forward when we look at the community because we gotta think about what are gonna be the community's needs in the future. And nine times out of 10 is actually having a livable wage and being able to stay in that community. The problem is a lot of people, they'll be in the community, but then they'll get priced out or they right. just can't afford it anymore in X amount of time because they weren't able to foster those marketable skills. But nine times out of 10, it won't be their fault. It's just they didn't have those offerings. Right, you, you said something to me that stood out. You said meaningful connections. And you said something about leaders being intentional about and not only intentional, but looking like the communities. So I think that's important. You know, my first year at Gutman Community College, I said to my team, I want to meet the community. Mm. So what we planned was a day, it was maybe a series of days where I went to the high schools where our students are arriving to us from. I met with the principals, mm -hmm. I met with students, I listened to them talk about what they hope to do once they go to college, but it was the meaningful connection. So now on campus, fast forward, students stopped me in the call so you you know you were at eagles academy yeah. you're one of the reasons that i decided to come because you came you took the time to come to my campus to talk to me about gutman community college so sometimes it's not about the college sometimes it's not about the prestige of the institution mm -hmm. but it is that meaningful connection that was made where students say you took the time to come and talk to me about just whatever it was they may for, have forgotten it but mm -hmm. the fact that i showed up and then there's this saying, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that is what, you know, a servant leader should demonstrate, that you have to be willing to go outside of 
your comfort zone. I mean, mm -hmm. here I am going to high schools. We're planning in a couple of days to go to bur borough visits where we're going to do acceptance on the spot mm -hmm. wherever the students are. They could be at work. Mm -hmm. They could be on the basketball court. They could be on the soccer field. But it is about the meaningful connections that I believe that students are wanting this next generation, Gen Z, and even the millennial population. They want to know how much you care about them before they really can trust you. And it goes down mm -hmm. to trust as well. And that's true because like, I feel like me personally and a lot of my peers, it was in the school system, you're just a number. So you don't want to feel like just a number because then it's kind of like, what is the motivation for me to go above and beyond? What's the motivation for me to do more? Some people just need that extra push. So actually showing up, they realize, oh, well, I'm not just a number to this guy. Like to this guy, I'm somebody who, if I'm on the campus, I can say, what's up? I can pop in the office. I can do whatever. And that just gives people, again, the sense of community. And it's funny because like recently I was reading, um, after the pandemic, a lot of people got like more lonely because of the isolation that was happening. Now, online interaction, in my opinion, I don't think it's the same as face-to-face, -face, in person, personal interactions. And as humans, we're very communal creatures. We learn in communities. That's like, if you go like way, way, way back, like hunters and gatherers, right? You had the hunters, you had the gatherers, but it was a communal thing. Because the hunters couldn't survive without the gatherers and the gatherers couldn't survive without the hunters. Then animals came into the fray and we domesticated them. But again, that's all that community aspect. There's a saying, and I, I remember now, it's if you want to go fast, go at it alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yes, yes. I, I mean, that just resonates to mm -hmm. the really the importance of leadership qualities as well. I mean, as, as a leader, you want to, yes, you, you certainly have position, you have power, mm -hmm. but you have to think about how do you oftentimes diminish the position and the power to empower the leaders who are working with you. Mm -hmm. And that, to your point, I, I think that's critically important. You know, I can't advance any organization that I've served well unless I approach that with a hu humility tope, mm -hmm. uh, trope, wherein I'm thinking that this is not about me. You know, yes, I have position and I may have power, but I cannot enact any of this vision mm -hmm. without there being a team who supports me. My team and I, we recently finished reading a book uh, called Starting With Why by mm -hmm. Simon Sinek. And that has been so transformative to me, personally, professionally, and to them, because I, it asked the question, so why do you do what you do, mm -hmm. right? What is defining your why? And then once you define your why, who is your who? And then what are your outcomes? How do you get there? So we begin to think about that in terms of the college is serving students is our why. We exist because young people, uh, returning adults, need an opportunity. They want an opportunity to change their lives, their families' lives, or they may be coming back for retool you know because mm -hmm. of the career that they've enjoyed for 10 years and they want to make a change but in order for us to truly actualize uh, the experiences that we want to see mm -hmm. from our students we as a leadership team have to define what that why is so for me that speaks to your your thought around you know how do we go you know faster further we, mm -hmm. we cannot do it alone we have to make sure that we're surrounding ourselves uh, with people who care and are invested in us and that goes back to your, your thought about mm -hmm. you know mentors it's important to not only choose a mentor because they were the top you know, person in their class and they, they went to the Ivy League school and they're working with you know, their CEO of this, because mm -hmm. oftentimes those persons may not have uh, attitudes and they may not have you know, the, the likeness that we desire because they may think about things differently, but it's about really people who have invested in you, people who you can say that you can trust, mm -hmm. who truly want to see you survive because some people will look at you as a threat. Yeah. Those are experiences I've had. So I've asked mentors, hey, I, I want to become you. Not you, yeah, yeah. but I want to move into that position. And oftentimes I experience, well, you need to wait five more years. So take mm -hmm. five years in this position, take five years in that position, mm -hmm. and then maybe you'll be ready. Mm -hmm. So it's really about, you know, to your point again, having people who will invest in you, having people who you can trust, but also in these positions, you have to really minimize that, 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 I would say that attitude that sometimes leaders have where it's about me and what I say goes. Mm -hmm. No, it's really about the organization. It's about the mission and the vision. And then how you can you as a leader corral, galvanize people mm -hmm. to support the vision that you um, are, are trying to you know form and moving an institution forward. And, you know, before I move on to the next question, I got to break character for a second because it's the first time I've had a guest all the time be like, you know, you, referring to what you said, referring to what you said, I feel like I'm on a date and, like, you know, I'm just being heard right now. <laughs> so um, the next question I want to ask, since you were talking a lot about education and your professional career, um, how did you get started in education and what was the moment that made you realize this is the work that I'm meant to do? Oh, gosh, that is a deep question. So I first realized it when my mom passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 1993, I lost my mother. I was 12. Uh, to a tragic car accident. She was on her way to work. Uh, she was enrolled 
at the community college mm -hmm. to um, earn her licensed practitioner nurse degree, LPN degree, as many may know it now. And when she passed, she left me, 12, my siblings, uh, who were both nine and six. And for me, I believe something happened. I have to grow up quickly. I had to start thinking differently about life because I had you know, two other siblings who I believe and knew looked up to me. And once we transitioned to move with my father, I began to think about life differently. Mm -hmm. uh, as I engaged with my you know, elementary school uh, band director and my high school band director, and then I began to engage with teachers who did not look like me. So now I'm reaching you know, 12, 13, and I'm beginning to see life mm -hmm. differently. I said, okay, how can I make a difference? What do I want to be my legacy? I knew I had a passion for reading, you know, the Tom Hardy bars. I, mm -hmm. I would go through, many people may not know what Tom Hardy is, but if you Google it, you, yeah. you'll find out. But it was just this collection of books and, and literature, and my love and my passion uh, was ignited about how characters were portrayed, you know, how storylines uh, were written, and also how, you know, the, the plot summary, those things engage mm -hmm. me, right? So that began the journey to say, well, I want to become a high school English teacher. But after arriving to Florida a University, I discovered that there was so much more I could do mm -hmm. and still reach the end goal of, you know, transforming lives of young people. Because directly across maybe a mile or two from the college was Tallahassee Community College. Mm -hmm. So after graduating from Florida and I went to Florida State University and I majored in humanities, you know, Greco-Roman societies. I was really intrigued mm -hmm. by the first theater, Despis, the first actor, uh, you know, just all that was about, you know, Greece and Rome, mm -hmm. uh, religion, art, literature, and philosophy. But I began teaching at the community college and I said, ah, maybe mm -hmm. because this population are dual enrollment students, they're still the target population I want to serve. Mm -hmm. But then I looked in my classroom and many of the students were my mom's age. Mm -hmm it then was cemented that this was my calling to make sure that I advocated for what I oftentimes will say the least of these, the single mother, the historically marginalized communities, the underserved communities, the LGBTQIA community, all of those, uh, I would say that, that resonated with me because I saw it in my classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that I was at the table and that I was advocating for them, not only just being a voice, but I was advocating for resources, I was advocating for programming. So it was at, I would say, Florida a University mm -hmm. and then Florida State where it really awakened in me that this would be my passion. And what I did you know, was position myself. You know, I took my full-time job as a faculty member, mm -hmm. and I did great. I loved you know, being a faculty member. I exposed mm -hmm. students to different experiences, but I knew that even within that role, there was still a limitation in terms of how I can really move the needle. And I began to seek after those administrative roles that mm -hmm. will allow me to be at the table. Some would say you want to be at the table and not on the menu. So I wanted to be at <laughs> yeah. the table. And that really was the start of my career. And I moved from uh, Georgia Piedmont Technical College to Broward College to become associate dean. And then my first campus CEO position um, was at St. Louis Community College at the Forest Park campus. I was about 34 at the time, mm -hmm. which was one of the, the youngest presidents, I would say, throughout the nation in terms of community colleges, and maybe four year. And that gave me the experience that I needed to then move on to a Phoenix College in the Maricopa Community College District, and now mm -hmm. at the Stella and Charles Gutman Community College. So. All of that happened within the time frame of about five years. Every two years, I was making a transition. And I want to encourage someone that's thinking about that. You know, I was told I need to be in a position every five years. If I took that approach from faculty member to dean mm -hmm. to provost, et cetera, I would then maybe in my mid-40s before now, according to that person, I was right. ready. So sometimes you have to disrupt what people have said about you and you have mm -hmm. to look inwardly to determine what you have in you and position yourself to know that, yes, they may have said that you take those nuggets, but you also take those nuggets and you use those as leverage to becoming who you want to become. And it's funny you mention that, too, because um, when you're talking about like before, you'd say, oh, yeah, I'd want to be like you. So can you help me out? And they'd be like, ah, you got to do X amount more. Yeah. I feel like in America specifically, we have a very crabs in a barrel mentality where yes. it's just like, OK, I had to suffer and do X amount before I obtained this. So you have to do the same. They look at it, I feel like, as a rite of passage, when in reality, it's going to change over time. Right. Like what worked for you back then is not going to work for me now. But then also taking that, infusing it with what you want to do, and then, you know, living and doing all this unapologetically, I think that's the new trend that's starting to happen or starting to emerge where people, 
they don't look at work and then their life differently. I mean, I know for the work life balance you will, but for most part, for the most part nowadays, people are looking towards work that they're passionate about. Cause then it doesn't seem like work. So when you do 20, 30 years in that industry, in that field, you don't look back with like disgusting, like, oh man, I spent 20, 30 years like behind a desk. You look back at 20, 30 years like, yo, I did some real dope stuff. Yeah. So you mentioned unapologetic. Mm -hmm. I use that often and I tell people that I am unapologetically uh, passionate about student success. You know, I want to see our students succeed. Mm -hmm. I want to create an atmosphere where they can come to the college and see themselves and they can have experience a sense of belonging. I oftentimes also tell people I'm apologetic about being an African-American male. Mm -hmm. You know, regardless of the stigma, regardless of all of the narratives that we see, if we're not unapologetic about who we are, how can we truly stand up and lead an institution from a place of authenticity? Mm. So that, that triggered me when you said unapologetic because oftentimes being unapologetic could might be you know perceived as something bad, but I think yeah. that we have to lean into who we are and we have to know who we are so that we can truly bring people along to really buy into, you know, really oftentimes what we're selling because we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to sell education in many regards, but we're trying to also sell a pathway to ones, you know, hopefully coming out of poverty if that's the plight of someone advancing in their career if they're coming back for retooling. So I, I love that being unapologetic because that's oftentimes we don't we don't like using those terms because it, it may say that you're, you're going against the status quo, but oftentimes it may take some disruption of the status quo in order for persons to develop, you know, their own individual development, or even if the organization has to move in a different direction. And um, it's funny because like I blanked out for a second because I was thinking like usually sometimes in the episodes I'll be like, damn, I'm not gonna have enough time, and I gotta like add more questions. But here I'm just like, there's so much substance that I'm like, damn, which one do I want to focus on? So I want to ask you, how has it been working as the president of Gutman Community College? Yeah, so it's it's been scary, mm -hmm. uh, it's been exciting, but most importantly, rewarding. Mm -hmm. uh, scary in that nationally. We've lost enrollment, mm -hmm. you know, within the City University of New York, within the community colleges. We've seen double digit en uh, enrollment declines, mm -hmm. but that's just not a symptom of just, you know, what's happening in New York City. Right. That's nationally. The pandemic has impacted us. So that's the scary part. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the, the, the exciting part is meeting uh, new people, you know, acclimating to a new region that I have no idea about that I've only spent the weekend the mm -hmm. past years coming because I vacationed here. Mm -hmm. Not knowing I would ever move to New York, but I will always come in the winter, take in a play, go to, you know, watch the Christmas tree lighting and mm -hmm. those type of things. But now the excitement of just living, breathing, experiencing this ecosystem has been great and rewarding uh, to see my first class of students under mm -hmm. my leadership um, commence from the college. It's rewarding. Any time that I can see a student walk across the stage, mm -hmm. change, knowing how they were when they came in and now who they are becoming and where they're transitioning to, hopefully for your colleges and universities mm -hmm. or directly to work, to me, that is the rewarding part of the job that says, okay, the long nights, uh, the, you know, sometimes the tensions that happen, mm -hmm. you know, with, you know, within the college environment. But on that day, if no other day, it really solidifies. This is why we exist. This mm -hmm. is why I'm here. And this is the, the work um, that has been laid to my hands to do. And I must be uh, very, very uh, proud of that. But I also must be a good steward of this experience mm. as well. And speaking about experiences, I mm. want to ask, can you share an experience that showcases what a student that goes to Gutman Community College learns and then applies to their own life and career? Absolutely. So there are so many students that, you know, I could I've met mm -hmm. over the last year and a half, you know, of being here. But our college has been one where we wanted to close the gaps of students uh, that are leaving the DOE, coming to a community college and leaving with excessive hours. That was kind of the plight back in 2000. The, the, I would say the early 2000s, students aren't earning or not earning mm -hmm. degrees, coming to community colleges, and they were not in pathways. They were just taking whatever they wanted. We would call it the mm -hmm. cafeteria model. Mm -hmm. So what Government Community College did was we created a, a cohort structure, a very defined first year experience where students would enter as a cohort. They will move throughout the first couple of months together so that they can build co team cohesion, they can build the camaraderie, and they were full time. Mm. So we wanted to make sure that that aspect was critically important because that has now uh, really helped the college to now tout that we have some of the best graduation rates, twice that of the national average. 
our students up until the last 10 years have really been prepared for mm -hmm. transfer. I, I would like to say we have been a great transfer college. So mm -hmm. we've embedded peer mentoring. Our students all have experiential learning opportunities because we, we embed that. We want to make sure that the competencies that employers are needing and wanting in students, that that is embedded in the curriculum, which is probably different than other community colleges nationally, but it has contributed to the success of the institution. So a student that is now arriving to the college will arrive to, I would say, a reimagined Gutman. So we're now employing new programs um, such as cybersecurity, uh, mm -hmm. such as networking, such as health information technology. And we're working on a number of other programs that will prepare students, yes, to go directly to a four-year college or university, but I'm also applying the equity lens in that mm -hmm. not everyone wants to move on to a four-year mm -hmm. college. So how can we make sure that we're providing a pathway for the four-year pathway or for those who want to go directly to the mm -hmm. world of work? That's similar to you know the community college atmosphere, but we want to make sure that we're finding what is our niche. You know, if it's going to be IT or all things in within that that mm -hmm. ecosystem, then let's lean into that because we understand that trying to be everything to everyone it all sometimes will weaken the brand of mm -hmm. the organization. But if we really find what we're strong at doing and we begin to scaffold that, I think you have a better product mm -hmm. that then someone would want to experience, and then I think that will also in turn lead to you know the enrollment increases that we want because we can show the outcomes. We can show that a student transition from Gutman Community College into you know a John Jay or a mm -hmm. Lehman etc and they were successful and I mentioned those because those are some of the schools where we have the most of our students uh, transition to or it could be the student that came uh, to the college and they're mm -hmm. leaving an entrepreneur right. so we have so many great students that that I can name and I don't want to name them because then you know someone might say well you know you didn't name this yeah. thing you didn't name that one but yeah. the college has transformed mm -hmm. the lives of so many students mm -hmm. uh, we invited the inaugural class back to celebrate the 10 years of the opening of the college in August mm -hmm. of 2022 and to see students who began at Gutman and to hear them say, oh, I'm a director here mm. with this organization. I'm a manager here. Or I, I'm, I'm, you know, an entrepreneur. I've started my own business. So while the college may not have had those programs, the mm -hmm. fact that they were able to leverage their first two years and then move on to a four-year college, to me, uh, lets me know that they were able to really achieve their dreams and Gutman was the place that helped to at least position them to do that. And I like the fact that, um, two points specifically, you were talking about how basically you're preparing them if they do the two years with that you can do x amount of things because sometimes i feel like with community colleges um like they'll do the two years and then they'll feel like when they go out into the workforce that it's kind of incomplete there's some gaps that they have to fill in but from what you're saying it seems like with gutman it's even with the two years if you decide four years not from you it doesn't matter there are really no gaps to fill in that earned experience you'll gain in the workforce but we've already prepared you to enter that workforce seamlessly and with the private connections and public connections and partnerships that you're making, you can prepare them for that aptly. And then the mm -hmm. other thing I was thinking about is um, one of my colleagues said the same thing, narrow your focus and just focus on a handful of things. Because it's so easy to always like, get kind of overwhelmed and be like, oh, I want to do this and this and this. But you got to be feasible too. Mm -hmm. And so focusing, and for her, it's like the rule of threes, right? Focusing on three things at a time really improve the quality insanely like and it's even like i think um i was thinking of something like poetic to say like oh i rather 100 percent of 50 than 50 percent of 100 but i'm like the end and the end goal will be the same but i feel like that works because at the end of the day you do want 100 percent of 50 than 50 percent of 100 because then there's still something left to be gained so with that being said um i want to ask at government community college what majors and minors are the most populars so I would say our human services program is one of the popular programs. Mm. Uh, our students are required to accumulate about 250 field experiences. So we place them in mm -hmm. the industry. If it's you know social work that they desire to do, they're placed uh, mm -hmm. with social workers. If it's you know community-based organizations, they're placed within the city so that they can determine you know if, is this something that I want to do. Uh, so that's one um, I would say field that is very very uh, important. And now liberal arts and degree, of course, mm -hmm. um, is very important as well because it provides students with that first two years of general education courses so that they, when they transfer to the receiving four-year college, they've already, hopefully, you know, they're transferring as a junior. Mm -hmm. So human services, uh, liberal arts um, and sciences would mm -hmm. be one. And I, I have a, a sneaky suspicion mm -hmm. that <laughs> when we launch cybersecurity, yeah. networking, and the fully online health information technology mm -hmm. degrees, 
I believe that we may begin to see an uptick in our numbers in the IT disciplines because mm -hmm. that is that is what the world is. You know, that is what students want to do. Students want to do, you know, STEM, or we also mm -hmm. now we're calling it STEAM. So I, I think that we're looking at labor market data to truly determine, you know, the first 10 years we did great. You know, mm -hmm. we, we had a great transfer initiative. Students were completing at record numbers. They were going on to four-year colleges and universities, and they were completing in under four years, which is the goal. But we also must – and had to reimagine so how do we attract more students is it the program offerings and if it mm -hmm. is the program offerings what can we bring that will differentiate us from mm -hmm. other colleges because we don't want to create pro programs that are just duplicative mm -hmm. i want us to focus on programs that will meet industry needs and where there is a need a need at the in the region mm -hmm. but also you know ensuring that we have the faculty and the staff that are able to really prepare students for those industries in a way in which we, we, we will be proud of. So in terms of program development, I would say that we, we still have some more work to do. We are moving programs through uh, our faculty, um, governance bodies now for even additional programs because mm -hmm. we truly want to make sure that our students have a broad experience that will prepare them for the world of work because we really believe in civic engagement and mm -hmm. we believe in social justice you know we have a course around social justice so we want to make sure that any inequities that we are dismantling them and that includes you know even in the program offerings in the past i would say to someone you know why would i offer basket weaving because i've offered basket <laughs> yeah. weaving for 30 years when i know basket weaving mm -hmm. leads to a less than you know less than lucrative income, mm -hmm. but when you look at the data, all of your students of color are in basket weaving. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at these programs, it's important that I'll be looking at data. Mm -hmm. You know, who's enrolling in the STEM programs? Who has access mm -hmm. to these different programs so that we can make sure that we are not inadvertently placing students, as I've seen in past uh, colleges, in programs where we know it will not change them or their families' lives. So as we're thinking about this re-envisioning of Gutman, we're scaling a successful model that works, but we're also t being very intentional about ensuring that equity drives the work that we're doing, even to program development. Mm -hmm. And it's um, thinking about it, right, because Gutman is fairly new. It's 12 years old at this point. How has Gutman Community College changed from its inception to now? Gosh, it's a good question. So the college flat was flat in terms of its administrative structures. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have uh, deans and and oftentimes you know directors or CFOs. So like any organization, you have to try and you know do different things to figure it out. So the college was meant to not have so many bureaucracies, but mm -hmm. you need some. You, yeah. you, you need to have you know a CFO. You need to have a director of control. You need to have all those positions. So I would say organizationally, we've changed in terms of the titles and the needs of the organization in order to get the work done. Um, but the mission has not changed. The mission of preparing students to be successful at, in their transfer colleges has not changed. But the programming you know, mm -hmm. aspects of thinking about adult students, that's changed. For 10 years, our goal has been to enroll students directly from the New York DOE. Mm -hmm. And we've done a great job. So over the last year, we began to think about, so if we're really looking at Gutman from an equity lens, what about the opportunity youth, the student right. who's not in school, who's not at work, 17 to 24, they have some college, no degree, or they may not have any, you know, degree. How do we work with them? Or what about the person who's been in their job 10 years and they want to come back for retooling? So now we're beginning to explore how can we as a college become what that student needs in order to grow and thrive as well? So we're, we're seeing some, some changes over the last mm -hmm. 10 years, and we have really expedited uh, much of the infrastructure that's needed in order to grow the college's enrollment in the next five years. And I, I feel like it's very, very powerful and important, the fact that you're focusing on those students that 1724, maybe some college, maybe some high school, but are just kind of like, I don't want to say floundering, but like just lost in the system. A lot of times people just fall through the cracks because, you know, there's already X amount of people that they have to worry about. But by you opening yourself up to these populations, it gives them that option to say, oh, you know what, even though I thought this may not be for me, all I got to do is a stint over here. And then even with the associates, go and do something else. Because you're mentioning IT, like those Google certifications are like super popular. People love doing those and then trying to go to a company. But by having, let's say, a more comprehensive workshop for that because I think Queens Community College I saw they had like a cybersecurity workshop it was five six weeks but oftentimes when you do certification workshops or certifications there's still a lot that you have to learn and then the employer kind of has to take on that 
quote unquote burden to then teach it to you. But it's always much better to just you, the college itself, the institution itself, to take that burden so that when they do go to the workforce, there's not much left to be learned other than advanced skills. The foundation is set. And then companies can comfortably take that risk and be like, okay, let's hire this person for this entry level of role and then they just grow into it over time. All right. And you know, one of the things to minimize that risk is to have companies at the table. Mm. You know, one of the mistakes I believe that colleges have made historically is that we have built it in hopes that they will come. <laughs> yeah. And they being the students. Uh-huh. You know, we've had we have great faculty who may not be in the industry, who have come out of the industry maybe five, ten, fifteen years. So they may not as be as connected to know what's trending, what's as mm-hmm. important. So when I say, you know, industry mineralizing the risk means that working with industry when you're thinking about a program if it's IT if it's cyber making sure that you already have those industry partnerships Mm. that was the success and I believe will be the success of the former uh, college Phoenix colleges before we opened the institute my team and I convened a forum where we brought in 50 plus uh, small medium and large size IT companies and we Mm. listened to them we said if we open this institute what type of employees are you looking for? So we were hoping to minimize the risk uh, that they would have to take and to also prepare them with a more, I would say, seasoned and a more qualified Mm -hmm. student because we've already employed all of the soft skills that many employers say, you know, students come to the good, but they lack the soft Mm -hmm. skills. So that's one of the things that we had to talk about. How do we embed professional development? What does that look like? But we use those conversations early on with employers to really then map out Mm -hmm. the programming that we uh, will add. And so we're doing the same um, at Gutman Community College. We're preparing to launch these different programs that that center around IT. We want to make sure that we're in that ecosystem in Manhattan just to better understand, Mm -hmm. you know, yes, there've been massive layoffs we hear about it all the time with Facebook and the other industries but what is the next five to ten year outlook truly look Mm -hmm. like and how can we partner to make sure that not only students get jobs but we want them to have paid internships I think that as they go to the the four-year baccalaureate degree seeking uh, institutions and they provide those students with internships paid often the community college because we're able to uh, matriculate more students more quickly out of the system I believe that if we were able to partner early on then we can close a lot of those gaps that they experience you know from what I've heard over my career mm-hmm. that students aren't ready so to me it's that early on partnership it minimizes the risk and then at the end you have a student that's better prepared um, to meet the rigor um, of that you know particular um, vocation mm-hmm. and it's it's crazy because that's such a tiny tweak in thinking where it's like instead of thinking about what we feel the students can benefit from and the companies want, just ask them, what do you want? And then provide that to the students. It's kind of like the student-centered approach versus the teacher-centered. Mm-hmm. With the teacher-centered approach, you're going to be like, all right, well, the students need to learn this and I'm going to think that they need to know this. Mm-hmm. Instead of just asking them, hey, what do you want to know more about? And then providing them with that service because ultimately we're providing them a service. They're our clients, so to speak. So why wouldn't we listen to our clients? Yeah. So that's that's a great question. I think about it in the basic form, mm. academic scheduling, when you, the way you schedule classes. We have, as an academic institution, always scheduled classes within certain blocks of time. Mm. Have we sat down to really ask students, so when can you register for classes? Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe even in the weekends works best for a third of the population. Mm -hmm. However, the institution may not offer evenings and weekends, so you've already probably like alienated lost, right you, you've mm-hmm. already lost a significant population of students so i think it's just as basic as just asking the students you know what is it that you would like to see happen mm-hmm. at the college and that's why I w- i'm so focused on with students i meet with them often mm-hmm. what do we need to change challenge me challenge the leadership mm-hmm. team you know my past sga president i empowered her mm-hmm. i said so after meeting with me you've shared all of your the things that you would like mm-hmm. to see send me an official letter oh, yeah, yeah. from you as the SGA president. Mm-hmm. And then I will share that with my leadership team and we will, within reason and within budget, we will begin to work mm-hmm. on many of those uh, things that we can do to foster more of you know, a cohesion on the campus, mm-hmm. uh, to make sure that it is in an ecosystem where you can feel like you can learn and thrive and grow. Mm-hmm. So it's sometimes, to your point again, it's asking the question. Mm-hmm. And it's what we have to do with you know any uh, new program that we're offering that will be career uh, mm-hmm. focus or you know tech focus or you know if it's externally focused in terms of preparing persons uh, for the world of work, well we need to ask industry mm-hmm. is this program preparing student X to be successful once they get to you 
Or are you willing to offer those experiential learning opportunities like job shadowing, mm -hmm. internships for those students? Because again, building it in hopes that they'll come, then we've done the student a disservice. I think that's almost a violation because we've, mm -hmm. we've promised them something that we cannot in turn, you know, um, really manifest. So I think those, those relationships that mm -hmm. we're fostering um, with the different organizations, uh, community-based organizations, and also with our you know career and tech ed areas, I think that's going to be really important for ensuring that we have the stories mm -hmm. in the future to say yes, you know this student you know finished this certificate, they were able to move into this job, and this is where they you know they are financially. I think that those are the stories that students want to see and hear. Those are the compelling narratives mm -hmm. that then to me reinforce the viability of the role of the community college and not to stigmatize you know, 14th grade or 13th grade mm -hmm. that I oftentimes hear people say over the years, well, you know, it's just a community college. Mm -hmm. Some also make the mistake, oh, it's just a junior college. Mm -hmm. It's not a junior college. We have faculty and staff who are PhD, master's degrees, have mm -hmm. a you know, significant number of years of experience. The likes of that are our four-year partners, you know, that's local and national. So we, we are still struggling, I believe, to even have a place in society around the importance of the work that we do. Most of your doctor, or not your mm -hmm. doctors, your your nurses, your your clinic your clinical lab mm -hmm. techs, your persons doing your X-rays, MRIs, if you think about it, some of them may have just there, and I won't say just, but they have an associate's degree. Mm -hmm. So it's that rethinking and helping people to re understand the role of the community college. And I think when people truly understand the mm -hmm. role and how many of these jobs that we go into the doctor's office and we're engaging with people mm -hmm. to learn, okay, yes, we have the MD, yes, we have you know the different um, you know professional degrees, but the other workers who are really moving the needle, mm -hmm. who are keeping the organizations moving forward, I mean, they may want to be in that position of a mid-level leader, and that's fine. But making sure that we as leaders are doing what I do diligence mm -hmm. to advocate for and also celebrate the work and the people who have graduated. Last point, one thing that we don't see enough of mm. is students who graduated from the community college uh, move on to a four year. We don't hear many of them say, well, I started out at the community college. Ah, I see what you mean. We're missing yeah, that. Yeah. We need to do more of that because then the alumni, they say, oh, I'm an alum of mm -hmm. X institution. I'm an alum of, well, you were also an alum mm -hmm. of the community college. So we have to do more around our marketing mm -hmm. and our branding and our program offerings and our engagement with the community so people truly understand, mm -hmm. you know, the role that we play in the, the really the critical nature of having. Mm -hmm an organization or an entity that is preparing students who would not ha otherwise have this opportunity because mm -hmm. not everyone can go into a college and have a, mm -hmm. a you know, high ACT, SAT or some other standardized exam, but it is the community college that can prepare them to be successful and ready for mm -hmm. that four-year college or university or workforce. And um, there's two things I want to focus on uh, what you just said, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess I'll work backwards because um, I think the stigmatization of community college is just it's wild. Like my younger sister, she went to community college, she went to QCC, and when she was going to QCC, right, like everyone in my family, everyone was like, oh, why are you going to QCC? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing whatever? But she ended up getting like a ton of scholarships over there, and then, you know, matriculated to Queens College, but to this day, she's always like, yeah, QCC was amazing, QCC was amazing. But I just think that the reason why it's so stigmatized is because of right beforehand high school so like even me when I was in high school right everyone they would clown community college and talk about it like oh well what are you gonna do over there what are you gonna do over there but I really think that the reason why it's like that I mean personally I don't know why but I feel that community colleges up until this point have kind of felt like a starter college so to speak and they've they would only give you the tools needed to move to the next step, which would be then the senior college. But then the problem is not everyone wants to go to the next step. Everyone has different journeys in their lives. And so for some people, they're fine with just going, or not just, but going to community college, getting their associates, and then working in that field, and then getting earned experience in said field. But that mindset shift of, okay, not just preparing them only for the step up, but what if that's the only step that they want to do? then that's fine. And preparing them for that gives them more confidence and then would make them say, yeah, I was a uh, alum of Gutman Community College because that's all they needed to do to then do all these things in their career. And then the other thing I want to focus on is the fact that the humility that you've been demonstrating and you've been talking about, I feel like that's a very, very important part as to why Gutman is shaping out to be the way it is because it's not often you're gonna hear about you know people actually listening, implementing it, and then saying, 
you have more, I'll take it. Because I think that's what really, really matters. Like even when you look at smaller scale, right? Like a classroom, a teacher asking the students for feedback, that's very important. Because how are you gonna know if what you're doing is impactful or not if your students aren't agreeing with you or they're not comfortable with it? But then the other thing is too, sometimes students feel very shy about saying these things because they haven't been in the environments where they felt compelled or empowered to talk about it. So from what you're saying, it seems like with Gutman Community College, you're like, yeah, you know, kitty gloves are off. Let me know how we're doing and what we can do to improve. And then the results are already showing itself. You guys have all these new offerings that you're looking towards, but that's forward facing. You're not looking at what's working right now. You're looking at what's going to work and benefit in the next five to 10 years, but you're still open to suggestions if the students have anything that they think may work too. Absolutely. And it's about building agency, mm. you know, and students. So while we, we may, some have, you know, said that we handhold students mm-hmm. and some students say, oh, my God, this is just like high school yeah. because <laughs> we're in a cohort, we're in a block. Mm-hmm. But we are essentially providing st- students with the tools that we know work. You know, when mm-hmm. we look at best practices, we know that if a student is full time, likely if they remain full time, they will complete in two years. Right. And that is why we have seen success there. We know that if we teach them how to advocate and we're doing more of that and how to build agency. We know that they will be successful. Mm-hmm. So so I think for institutions, we, we have to really think about how are we looking at our role as building leaders of tomorrow mm. and not just this is a stopgap for them or I came because I could not get into my preferred institution mm-hmm. but when you get them there the, all of those things may be true mm-hmm. but how do you then work with them to cultivate in them and empower them to be leaders you know so that when they are making decisions like voting you know when they're making decisions to run for office mm-hmm. they can look back at their experience and say oh gosh yes, I went to my mm-hmm. local community college and I went to the day at the Capitol mm-hmm. I met my elected officials they were on campus often or mm-hmm. I met the CEO of X company I was able to go to a networking event with my president mm-hmm. or my vice president so so it's about cultivating the experiences that we want students to remember. Mm. And I think that will begin to change the, the stigma because then students will say, oh, gosh, at Gutman, mm-hmm. I had got a chance to go to a Broadway play and I'm from the Bronx and I've never mm-hmm. been. Those are some of the things I heard. Similarly, when I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, I would mm-hmm. take students to the Fox Theater. Students lived yeah, in yeah. St. Louis all their lives, had passed mm-hmm. by it, had never attended. So for me, it's always about how can we create the conditions mm-hmm for success. And if we are not passionate about creating the conditions that will then lead to Mm -hmm. a successful outcome, we're just spinning our wheels and we'll never see the true uh, manifestation of what the student can become Mm -hmm. or also what the institution can become. And speaking about the institution, um, we're reaching like the final stretch of the episode. So I want to ask you, and it's crazy because like I knew this was going to happen. I had a list of questions and I was like, all right, I'm going to try to get to all of them. I did not because the organic conversation was much better. So just so you guys know, no, this is scripted. But um, I want to ask you, what are your goals for the institution's future? Oh, gosh, that is that is a great question. So when you put goals out there, people mm-hmm. hold you to them. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'll say my, my aspirations for mm-hmm. the college, number one, to grow our enrollment. Uh, we cannot grow our enrollment unless we really take um, a, you know, exploration around who we were and then what do we have the capacity and the means to do and also then what is the need in the local region. Mm. So growing enrollment is so similarly connected to the former, right, or the latter. But we we have aspirations to to grow our enrollment. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to make sure that our campus is one where our students feel like they can belong regardless of who they are. Mm. Uh, So we are really focusing on elevating equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. So we recently completed our five-year strategic plan. It's called Gutman Forward 2028. Mm -hmm. And we will begin the implementation stages in September of 2023, this year. So within those, uh, we have five pillars that we're focused on. Uh, equity and inclusion and belonging. Uh, we're focusing on you know student success and academic excellence. Uh, we're focusing on employee vitality and, and excellence. Uh, and we're also beginning to focus on you know, growing enrollment, as I mentioned. And lastly, operational efficiency. So within uh, those that five those pillars, it will guide the work in terms of associated uh, goals and objectives and mm-hmm. metrics. So growth is important. Fostering a sense of belonging on the campus is important. Advancing the brand of who we are. Mm. Uh, I want to make sure that, you know, our digital footprint, I want to make sure that our website, Mm -hmm. it's included in that that conversation, our marketing collateral, both print and media, really, to me, tells the story of Gutman Community College. And those are some areas that I think that we have an, an opportunity. So 
in about five years, I hope that we have made our enrollment target. It's my hope that mm -hmm. we have also created new academic programs that will garner um, the local and the national our reputation and students would want to come to us. You know, with our fully online program, it's my hope that we have students mm -hmm. from the local tri-state region that will see this as a popular program that will lead to work. So I want us to be a better institution uh, and I want us to be not what we were yesterday, but I want us to be the institution of the future, continuing to innovate, continuing to truly um, show the best of what community colleges can become and how they can transform lives. Did we just find the new tagline for Government Community <laughs> College? I'll send you the invoice for that, by the way. But um, the last question I'm going to ask you before we get ready to wrap up is, if you could go back in time and do anything differently, would you or would you not? Mm. So, I and this is, this is like very personal, mm -hmm. but I think it's, so I'll answer it in two ways. Mm -hmm. If I could change anything, I would make sure my mother didn't leave the house mm. that morning, right? Um, because I think my life would have been different. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that, because she did leave and everything that transpired after that mm -hmm. would not have also happened because I believe that my trajectory would have been different. Mm -hmm. So I say all that to say that I look at loss, mm -hmm. trauma, and disappointment as all preparing me to sit with you today. Mm -hmm. Because those experiences of losing a mother and not crying for a, mm -hmm. a year and processing it all, mm -hmm. it was building, building character, it was building integrity, it was building mm -hmm. all of the things that I knew that I would deal with, trans, you know, moving from one state to mm -hmm. another, and all of the movements that I've made in life uh, was truly because I was already equipped. Mm -hmm. So I, I would, if I could change mm -hmm. that, I think the personal part of me, I would want her here. Mm -hmm. But the other aspect of that is that I believe that it was intentional and it was timing that in, in so many, why mm -hmm. would you say that? But it has really informed it because I, I believe that her her strength and her mm -hmm. passing then was for me to take on that next level of, of growth mm -hmm. and development. And each of my siblings and I, we both graduated from Florida a mm -hmm. University. Um, my sister is a medical doctor. She mm -hmm. took my mother's um, drive of wanting to be in a medical profession. And my brother is an, an IT consultant. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that things happen the way they are meant to happen. But it really depends on how do we, how do we arrive at those moments and how mm -hmm. do we treat those moments? Because I could have done so much more. It could have mm -hmm. been substance abuse. It could have been so many other things, but I really knew the type of person she was. Mm -hmm. And I have used that throughout, I would say my last 20 plus years of my life to really think about the impact that she made, the servant leadership qualities that she brought in that I now embody those. And that is now what drives this disposition um, as the president of Government Community College. You know, I feel like ah, it's, it's, you're a tough act to follow, you know, because as you're talking right now, like I was getting emotional. I'm getting a little teary eyed. I'm going to ask you the next question so we can focus on your camera so they don't see me like crying right now. <laughs> but um, summarizing the episode, is there anyone you want to shout out? Uh, any stakeholders, students, faculty, whatever? That's your camera right there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So uh, the work that I do is critically important. Uh, as a president of Gutman Community College and certainly as the second president of Gutman Community College, uh, the work that we're doing is we're committed to access and success for our historically marginalized and our minoritized communities. And as the college continues to grow and develop, we are certainly looking for thought partners. I have a great faculty, a great staff, great senior leadership team who's committed to advancing uh, this college and making it one of the best community colleges in New York City and New York State. So I look forward to hopefully partnering with you as we think about what Gutman is, but also what Gutman can become. And as I always say to my college, and they always know that I say this at the end of every message, for Gutman Community College, the best is still yet to come. So that's what I would say. Yeah, listen, man, at this point, I'm going to give you my job as the <laughs> host of this because I feel like you're just so much more like, yes, you know, philosophical, but then also like you can get behind that mission. But with that being said, that does wrap up episode two of Education in Color. I'm upset because this is the second episode. So I'm going to tell all my other guests, please don't get offended if this is the most popular one. But we'll see you guys for episode three. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for coming on today. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Take care. Thank you.